my name is Elizabeth Harrington, and I'd like to welcome you to the third in a series of live events that have been recorded as webinars with Dr. Lewis Cady. He is a neuropsychiatrist of Cady Wellness Institute, which is located in Evansville, Indiana. Now, the third in the series is all about, let me put my glasses on, the do-it-yourself treatment of depression at home, and not as crazy as it sounds. So once again, welcome, and over to you, Dr. Cady. So before I even start showing you slides, I found this article <clears throat> on uh, Medical News Today, and it was published 11 hours ago. Uh, people dealing with mental health challenges may be more vulnerable than others during a public health crisis because they are more likely to pick up infections, Accessing treatment can be difficult for them, hence our focus on do it to yourself at home in a responsible way. The emotional stress of COVID-19 and social isolation makes your pre-existing condition worse. Quarantine can prevent you from accessing your usual treatment, such as going to therapy sessions or practicing certain lifestyle choices. And then further, people that actually have depression during this pandemic may now find themselves having difficulty accessing their medications, facing unusually intense fear about the spread of COVID-19 and how it may affect our loved ones as we talked about my BMW Z3 convertible driving depressed and anxious patient last time, feeling extremely anxious about their finances, feeling uncertain and confused about how to shop for necessity, withdrawing more due to social isolation and experiencing an increased sense of helplessness and hopelessness about the future. So tonight, I want to address those issues, and I have got a rather unique and, I assure you, responsible, medically responsible uh, presentation to share with you. So with that, let me share my screen. <clears throat> So welcome to this third of five webinars. The topic tonight is do-it-yourself treatment of depression at home, not as crazy as it sounds. And to be fair, I have a lot of my patients doing similar things. Their medications may not be working exactly correctly, and so I will add things to what they're, to what they're doing. Um, if you don't have a treating physician or healthcare practitioner, and you are scratching your head when you walk into the uh, vitamin store and saying, gee, what could I possibly do to make myself better? Well, then I have some answers for you. And we're actually going to start not in the mental system, but in the endocrine system. So here are some housekeeping details. Uh, my email is lkady at katywellis.com. It occurs to me that I may not have been meeting all of your needs. And if I haven't, I want to hear about it. Don't consider yourself a whiny complainer. Consider yourself somebody that needs to educate me about what you need and what you want. So don't be bashful. And then we've got some more suggested questions coming later. Uh, as per usual, the slides for this presentation will be at slideshare.net forward slash LKDMD. They are not there yet because, for some technical reasons, but they'll be there later tonight. So if 2020 was a slide, this is what it would be. There have been some unexpected events, specifically COVID-19, the pandemic, social isolation, uh, government incompetence, um, and kind of everybody scratching their head about when is it gonna be safe to come out and um, engage in life again. Tonight, I'm going to start with what Hamlet said. He said, there are more things in heaven and earth than are dripped up in your earthly philosophy, Horatio. And frequently, patients and practitioners don't really think outside of the box. They just think about what, what, are in, what is in their earthly philosophy rather than all the things possible that could be done to get a patient better. And from Richard P. Feynman, one of my favorite guys, he was, the, uh, he was a Nobel Prize winning physicist. Uh, he was the head of the Challenger Space Shuttle Commission disaster probe. 
And Feynman said, if you just know the names of the terms, you absolutely know nothing and know nothing about it. <clears throat> so if you just know the name depression, <clears throat> you don't have a clue about it. To begin, let me show you this picture of the courthouse in Evansville, Indiana. Now, it's an okay picture. Uh, anybody could have snapped it with their phone. But for the discerning among us, you will see that that's kind of distorted and it's got these converging lines going up. When I ran it through a photo processing program on my computer, I was able to straighten the lines. It's called perspective control. And suddenly, it looks much more true to life. Same device, same uh, building, same device I took the picture with, same image, but with the perspective control. And that's what I'm going to be talking about tonight, kind of controlling our perspective about depression. So here's a slide on selecting your perspective. If you think you're depressed, your diagnosis may be wrong. I get people all the time coming into Katie Wallace Institute to see me, my nurse practitioner, Dr. Gavin, oh, I'm depressed. No SSRI has been helpful. Uh, my doctor says I need to see the psychiatrist because he's out of his element. You may not be depressed. Your treatment may be wrong or not even yet started or insufficiently potent. Your presumptive medical stability may be wrong. <clears throat> when I came to Evansville, I would work up people for thyroid problems and I'd check a TSH and if it came back, normal, I'd say, great. And if it came back abnormal, I'd send them to the endocrinologist and they would be started on a particular kind of medication <clears throat> and then they wouldn't get better. And your hormones may be out of the optimum range. My friend and mentor, Neil Rousier says, the definition of normal labs are or is when your labs are as crappy as everybody else's. That's a normal lab. So if you're in the mid range, if you're in the bottom range, oh, you're normal. Whereas you may not be optimal. So we'll talk about that. I love this quote from this guy. He said, there are things known and there are things unknown and in between are the doors. So that's what I want these seminars to be, these webinars to be like for you. I want them to be doors that you can walk through and get an entirely new perspective and a new view about what may be going on. So <clears throat> let's start with this path. And let's say you have symptoms of depression. And so you're gonna start down the path because you have symptoms of depression. I want you to really remember this. Your symptoms are not your diagnosis. Kind of like I talked about last week, the map is not the territory. Your symptoms are not your diagnosis. You say you're depressed. You've lost interest in things. You're feeling tired like a slug. It does not mean you're depressed. It means you have those symptoms. So let's define, oh, let me tell you about the definition. So there are a couple of points that I wanna make about this. Number one, nutrient deficiencies tonight that we're going to cover can cause thyroid dysfunction, iron deficiency, and flat out depression. And by not nominalizing these, getting them optimum, sometimes the depressive symptoms go away. And there are some things you can do at home. And tonight, we're going to be talking about the things that you can do at home. And there are some things you shouldn't do at home. And I'll tell you what those things are too. So this is a quick review. Week one, I'd call it staying alive. This is, and I put it week one because I wanted you to stay alive and not get infected with COVID-19 because it doesn't matter what optimal mental state you've got and all your hormones optimized. If you're in the, in the ICU on a vent, it's not a good time. <clears throat> and we reviewed nutrient concepts that time. Last week, we talked about basically how not to screw yourself up inside your head. And we talked about how the concept of psychology can affect your mood. In other words, your thoughts can affect your mood and actually your thoughts can affect your neurotransmitters. So there's an inaccuracy of, well, it just must be your neurotransmitters. You have a Prozac deficiency. You have a Lexapro deficiency. 
You need the latest and greatest, Trentelix or Vibrant. Um, maybe not. And this week, I'm going to tell you it's not just your basic nutrients or your psychology, but it's also your micronutrients and your genes. What's going on in your genes can affect your world and your reality. Symptoms are not your diagnosis, and you can do something about these things at home. So the logo of Katie Wellness Institute is this. It's an integral sign, and we integrate mind and body for peak performance arranged around three things. The body, which is the platform, the biological platform. The mind, which is the thoughts you think, the conclusions you have about the world, and your actions. And really, we talked about quite a lot of this last time. The problem with psychiatry and mental health is that it's like the classic bearded Freudian analyst, uh, and the guy is talking to him, and it's like, it's all about the mind. It's all about the mind. It's all, you need more analysis. You need another decade of analysis. You need five more years of therapy. Mind, mind, mind. Whereas if the body is not stabilized, you're going to have problems with the mind body. So I love what the little girl said about this guy, Socrates. Little girl was preparing her book report for school, and she was supposed to tell the class about Socrates. And she said, Socrates was a nice old man in Greece that wandered around in a toga. He asked people questions. They killed him. That was her conclusion about Socrates. He asked too many questions, they killed him. But this is a great quote from Socrates. He said, the beginning of wisdom is the definition of terms. So I want to define what depression and anxiety are. Depression and anxiety in one easy lesson. So here's depression. When I was going through my clerkship in psychiatry at my medical school, we were taught this across the SIG, ECAPS. And the interesting thing about that is SIG, that means take thou of. So uh, frequently physicians in the olden days would write SIG and then they would put something. So SIG, e -caps, energy capsules. You prescribe energy capsules. That's the way we could remember it. So the first S is sleep. And then you see the two symptoms there in green, sadness and loss of interest. Um, and you have to have one of those to have the diagnosis. Guilt, poor energy, poor concentration, appetite changes, psychomotor symptoms, that means feeling sped up or slowed down, and finally suicidal ideation. Here's the scoring key. Five of nine with one of these two symptoms minimum present for two weeks, and you get the diagnosis of depression. Or do you? Here's anxiety. <clears throat> This is generalized anxiety disorder, and I learned from this family physician, Otis Bowman, swicker is quicker. Worry plus three is GAD. So in order to have a generalized anxiety disorder, you must be sitting around fretting and worry. Not just occasionally, it should be your baseline state. And then if you have somatic symptoms like energy, irritability, concentration, keyed up, insomnia, restlessness, worry plus three, you get that diagnosis. Now here's the fly in the ointment. For both of these conditions, the DSM-4, the DSM-4-TR, and the DSM-5, which are our diagnostic Bibles, requires that you cannot have these symptoms as a result of a medical condition. You, and if you do, then you can't say the patient is depressed. You say the patient has a mood disorder due to a general medical condition. This happens all the time when patients come in to see me. And you also have to rule out bipolar if, the, if you've got too much energy. So energy, beware, beware, beware. Too much energy, you have to work up bipolar. So you've got five out of nine present with at least one of those two cardinal features and the patient has been diagnosed with depression. So let's start Prozac. This is the picture of a psychiatrist that thought that that would be a good idea. It is the dreaded 
craniorectal inversion syndrome, where somebody isn't really thinking clearly. They've got the they've got the symptoms. Well, obviously it's depression. Let's just knee jerk fire off some Prozac at them. So, not a great thing to do. We're going to talk about what we should do, but before that, there are some polling questions and my. Uh, co-conspirator in this webinar, Elizabeth Harrington and I came up with some polling questions from yesterday. And I would like Elizabeth to pop back up and share those questions if she is available. I, I don't see her on the screen right now. And Elizabeth, I'll give you about 15 seconds to come up with those polling questions. And if not, we'll, I'll, I'll, tell, I'll tell the folks what they were and then we can go on. Are you, are you there? Are you ready? I think I'm unmuted. Can you hear me? Yes. Good. We were having some fun with those technical issues. I'm going to actually, I think, um, it, it put it over to Kareen. Kareen, can you just pull that up? Yes, yes I can. All right, because um, if you could just um, bring up the poll questions for the group while I'm working with through my technical snafus. There we go, they're up now. Okay, Corrine, do I need to get out of stop my screen share or are you good? Um, can you see them? I've got them up. But I cannot can... see them. Okay, then um, yes. I'm stopping sharing, okay. Yeah. Can you see them now? Oh, no. no, you can't because I have to start my video. Okay. There we go, is that right. it? And while you're doing that, let me just share with everybody. My philosophy about these webinars is None of us have done things like this before, but we're just going to have a really good old time as we keep going through it and we will we will solve our technical problems as we go. Okay, fantastic. So here are the polling questions and these are totally anonymous. I'm just kind of curious what's going on. So question number one, have you or a loved one become depressed in the context of COVID-19? Yes or no? Have you or a loved one had financial reversals as a result of COVID-19? Yes or no? Have you or a loved one had difficulty accessing meaningful mental health or medical care because of the social distancing? And it has only got no. Uh, truly, we're not trying to massage your answer. So we'll, uh, <clears throat> we'll pay attention to one and two. So no, the yes, the yes was just below the screen. I think it's there now. Okay. <clears throat> oh, I see. You have to drag it down there on the on the right. Very good. Yeah. All right. Has everybody voted? There's a few more to go. Again, this is totally anonymous. We're not going to track you down, rat you out to your spouse or your mama. Um, okay. I'm gonna. I'm gonna go back to sharing my screen in five seconds. Okay. Okay. And then we'll check back in later for the results. Okay. I'll end the polling now then. Okay, very good. Okay. I'm going to share my screen. Is it back up? Uh, yes. Okay, great. So this is a classic example of a typical patient that a typical patient now that's coming in to see me. Her, she presented with, as we say in our trade, the chief complaint of, they say I have gastroparesis. And you say, well, why are you seeing the shrink for that? <clears throat> well, because her chiropractor son heard that I was a holistic physician and there were some symptoms of depression, so she was sent in. So, here is her history in a nutshell. She had intense abdominal cramping for six years. She had an intestinal motility test that was abnormal. It was slow. She had a history of depression in the 1990s. She was, on menop she was menopausal and on poorly chosen hormone replacement. And in terms of her current symptoms, she had the symptoms of being dead, down in the dumps, sad, lack of or loss of interest in things. That's the second one. Fatigue and lack of energy, that's the third one. All I need is two more to make the diagnosis of depression if it's not caused by something physical. 
prior to the first appointment with me, I had ordered some testing and she had uh, a delayed food allergy test. This is a type of test, you, you, it's not where the allergist pokes you with things or puts the needle under your skin or uh, does a blood test and tells you that you can never have peanuts or you're going to die. That's an IgE test. IgG is for the kind of mysterious, lurking food allergies that you may not know that you have. And so she was found to be gluten sensitive and dairy sensitive. She presented to me off of those. She had a low DHEA level on the labs. I started her on treatment the first time. She had a low vitamin D level. I started her on treatment at, at the intake session. And I began using progesterone and up, adjusting it upward because her level wasn't good. I reformulated her HRT. And when she came back after, after the intake for her first appointment, her depressive symptoms were down to just one symptom, fatigue and lack of energy. And we've just about got that taken care of. So <clears throat> I want you to consider target symptoms in major depression. Almost 100% of people with major depression have a depressed mood and impaired concentration. <clears throat> but you look at the energy, reduced energy, fatigue or loss of energy, tiredness, hypersomnia, that's a lot of things that are going on in patients with depression. And these symptoms are related to hypothyroidism. And I'll show you in a second. So as of two days ago, if you look on PubMed, hypothyroidism and depression, you will find 1,103 citations. This is not an unknown condition. <clears throat> Here are a few common symptoms of hypothyroidism. Over on the left of your screen are all the mental things, depression, fatigue, concentration problems, poor cognitive performance, lack of motivation, reduced libido. Uh, you can actually have psychosis where uh, the patient has such a low thyroid that they're just psychotic. You can even have an exacerbation of bipolar symptoms. On the right, you see the physical symptoms, cold intolerance, weight gain, slow uh, muscle reflexes where they tap, tap your knee with a little triangular hammer, brittle hair and nails, loss of eyebrows on the outside, so-called lateral aspects of the eyebrows, high blood pressure, and constipation. So you can have high blood pressure with low thyroid. You can also have high blood pressure with high thyroid. So <clears throat> my, uh, my brother-in-law is a guy named David Herschelman. He's a great hunter. I went into his basement for the first time, looked around, and he's got deer heads mounted all the way around. I mean, big bucks. He's, he's a good sportsman, good hunter, uh, eats what he kills. But there were a lot of deer heads down there. Th those were his trophies. So me... I've been collecting these kind of trophies. So I, I am now collecting no eyebrows. This is an early 20s college student. She presented with weight gain, fatigue, and brain fog. She saw numerous doctors asking for help, and she was told nothing is wrong with your thyroid, your labs are fine. And yet, sitting across from her, I noticed she had no lateral eyebrows. Short story is, she did have something wrong with her thyroid. Not enough labs had been tested. We found out what it was. We treated her and she was better after one appointment. This is another of my patients, no lateral eyebrows. She was hypothyroid. This is another person that came up to me after I lectured one time with her eyes filled with tears. And I thought, well, this is unusual because I don't usually move my audience to tears. And she said, you see these eyebrows? I said, yes. She said, they're tattooed on. I kept telling my doctors that there was something wrong with me, and they said, everything is fine. I had no eyebrows, so I had them tattooed on. Finally, I know what the matter is. You know, that's a little, it's a little late after you get them tattooed on, right there. And this was a physician's wife. You'll, you'll notice she just has no lateral eyebrows. She presented with the chief complaints of fatigue and no sex drive. And I fixed her thyroid and she was one happy camper after that. So let me tell you uh, <clears throat> what happens when you go to the regular doctor. This is the gospel according to the American Academy of Clinical Endocrinology, uh, which is basically 
in my opinion, manipulated by a particular drug company, which I will not name, to push and advance their drug, which is synthetic thyroid hormone. And the notion is check the TSH and treat with T4, synthroid levothyroxine, right there. If the TH TSH result is normal, a euthyroid status is assumed and testing stopped. Now, when I grew up, grew up down home with the good old boys, I was told that assume means it makes an ass out of you and me. So the euthyroid status, that means your thyroid is great. It's beautiful. It's assumed. Maybe it shouldn't be assumed. And there is no apparent thyroid disorder, and I, I would buy that. There is no apparent thyroid disorder. Uh, additional testing is not indicated, and I would not agree with that. So Dr. Will, uh, years back at Mayo, said truth is a constant variable. So that was the truth a few years ago, and it's the truth based on the input of special interest. But I'm, I want to share with you more sophistication about the thyroid than your doctor probably has. And I know that's a bold claim, but let, let me break it down for you. You say, why are you talking so much about the thyroid? Because number one, if your thyroid is out, it could make you depressed or it could worsen depression. And number two, it's actually something that you can fix at home or maybe try to fix uh, before you go in to see the doctor. So with a test that you can do at home, I'll tell you about it. This is the classic way to work up the thyroid. It starts with the TSH, which is up in the pituitary. And when you check TSH, it only answers the question, how hard is your pituitary working to stimulate your thyroid gland, which is the butterfly shaped gland in the neck, which pumps out thyroid hormone. And interestingly, you have to have iodine to make that. 65% of your thyroid hormone is iodine. But that doesn't do you any good. T4 doesn't do you any good. It's the foot soldier of T4 called T3 that actually does thyroid things to the body. And in order to make that, you have to have selenium. And if you don't, you don't make enough T3. And then um, and 80% of that happens in the liver. And then reverse T3, that's the evil twin. It's like the sorority sister, that's the evil sorority sister that, or fraternity brother that uh, squirts super glue into your lock so you can't stick your key in. Reverse T3 does that to the T3 receptor and it will hibernate you. So I tell my patients it's the evil twin. Now the interesting thing is <clears throat> T4 does does feedback to the thyroid, to the pituitary, and it says, thanks, we got plenty. T4 feeds back to the pituitary and says, thanks, we got plenty. And reverse T3 feeds back to the pituitary, and it also says, thanks, we got plenty. So if the pituitary gland gets the idea that, thanks, we got plenty out there, and I don't have to keep pushing on the thyroid gland, well, then it backs off the TSH goes down and you appear normal. But your TSH could be low totally because of this elevated reverse T3 right here that's doing it to you. So here are the factors that affect your thyroid function. Uh, you have to have iron, iodine, tyrosine, zinc, selenium, vitamin E, B2, B3, B6, C, and D for your thyroid gland to make T4. The factors that affect the change from T4 to reverse T3, the evil twin, the one that makes you hibernate, are stress. How many of you have noticed that COVID-19 and social isolation may be just a little bit stressful? Stress can do it. Trauma, uh, a low calorie diet, if you're white knuckling it and just trying to, trying to hang on by your fingernails and, and say no, 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 and not eat, uh, that can do it. Inflammation, toxins, uh, mold in the environment, infections, liver, kidney dysfunction, certain medications, all can shift your T4 to reverse T3. Here are the factors that inhibit your proper T4 production. Stress, again, infection, trauma, radiation, uh, fluoride in your toothpaste, for reasons we'll see in a second, toxins, uh, and celiac disease. 
And then you have to have zinc and selenium to, to convert your T4 to T3. And then you have these factors that improve the cellular sensitivity to thyroid hormones, vitamin A, exercise, and zinc. You've heard it said that exercise can make you feel better. Well, one of the reasons is it sensitizes your receptors in the nucleus and the mitochondria to work. This is a very quick citation, thyroid hormones, T3 and T4 in the brain. Here's the punchline, thyroid hormones effects on brain relates to balance of T4 and T3. And this thyroid receptor alpha-1, which is 70 to 80% of all thyroid receptor expression in the adult vertebra, vertebrate brain, likes T3, the foot soldier. So ladies and gentlemen, it doesn't matter what your TSH is. It doesn't matter what your T4 is. It doesn't even matter what your T3 is. It matters really what your T3 and your reverse T3 is so that the T3 can get to the receptor without the reverse T3 blocking it. Those are the two critical things. So I've been asked if I could, you know, how do I test the thyroid? And I say, well, if I can only have one test, it would be T3, free T3. If I could have two, it would be free T3 and free T4. Excuse me, free T3 and reverse T3. If I could have three, I'd add T4, and if I could have four, then I'd add the TSH. The TSH is really uh, not all that helpful when you look at it in the context of the peer-reviewed medical literature, but it is the gold standard right now. Check TSH, treat with T4. If that's what ha what's happened to you, and you're still feeling like a slug with poor energy and depression, it's probably because your thyroid is not optimized. Now, how much iodine do you need? I have this kind of wild and crazy older guy in my practice. I'll show you one of his labs in a bit with no names. Um, and he's always telling me about, you gotta have more iodine. You gotta have more iodine. You gotta have more iodine. I want you to read this book on iodine. <clears throat> and I've been kind of, particularly when I looked at this, adults need 150 micrograms of iodine per day. It's the recommended amount. So, you know, you got 150 micrograms, you ought to be okay, right? Well, here are, let's talk about thyroid deficiency. Here are the four main causes. Number one, the thyroid gland just stops producing it. Number two, you get con decreased conversion of T4 to T3. Number three, you have less effectiveness at the receptor sites. And number four, you have elevation of reverse T3. Sorry, I should have put that back. So now let's talk about what does the recommended amount mean? The recommended daily allowance is the average daily level of intake sufficient to meet the nutrient requirements of nearly 97 to 98% of healthy individuals. What does that mean? It means they won't get goiter. If they don't get goiter, then they must be healthy. It's kind of like if you don't get scurvy, well, your vitamin, uh, your vitamin, your vitamin C ought to be fine. If, if you don't get bow-legged from uh, lack, of, uh, lack of calcium, then your vitamin D must be fine. So the, the focus that contemporary allopathic medicine has on just meeting the nutrient requirements, not necessarily a good idea, and I'll show you why. But what if you are unhealthy? Is that enough to help you if you're unhealthy? Is that enough to help you if you're low thyroid? Is that, is that enough to help you if you have fibrocystic breast disease? Is that enough to help you if you don't want to die of cancer? So there are two perspectives on iodine deficiency. This one says we have deficiency. Uh, U.S. dietary iodine intakes have decreased drastically since the 1970s. This was in 2019. This is a more modern paper. This one says, hey, we got plenty. Adequate iodine uh, nutrition in the general U.S. population since 2000. What does adequate mean? What does adequate mean? Does it mean we're optimally healthy? We couldn't possibly be any better? No, we don't have goiters. So let's talk about sources and locations of iodine deficiency. First of all, uh, if you drink from your tap and you don't have a carbon fill, a charcoal filter on it, which we do here, 
you're getting either chlorinated water or fluoridated water. I think it's chlorine here. If you're not using iodized salt, or if you're a victim of this low salt craze, you're not getting iodine in your salt. <clears throat> if you're consuming instead of, uh, if you're consuming lots of regular salt, sodium chloride and processed foods, it's going to squeeze out the uh, iodine. If you're consuming these so-called goitrogens, cabbage, broccoli, cauliflower, and Brussels sprouts and soy, or if you live in the goiter belt, which I will show you, you might have um, iodine deficiency. Being pregnant, that will suck the iodine right out of your body. You need more than the usual amount. And people living with iodine deficient soils and eating local foods. And again, what does that have to do with me? So I looked up the goiter belt. Now this is very interesting information. These were people that showed up, excuse me, the, this was the iodine concentration in drinking water in the US in 1924. And you will notice right there in Evansville, Indiana, the southwestern tip of the, or the, yeah, southwestern tip pretty much of the tri-state. Um, we have poor iodine in our drinking water because of what's in the soil. <clears throat> now, in 1939, drafted men in the U.S. in the, in World War One were examined for goiter, and you will see that Indiana is now not on that map. And in fact, some of it looks like it's better. And the reason is that in 1924, iodized salt was introduced, so it helped with goiters from the goiter belt, but there was still a lot of it around. So the iodide, the iodinated salt helped, but uh, still a lot. Now, I talked about some of this the first time. I want to go over it again. I promise we're going to get to the depression and what you can do about it. This is one of my favorite papers by Bruce Ames. It's called Low Micronutrients Intake may accelerate the degenerative diseases of aging through allocation of scarce micronutrients by triage. What in the heck does that mean? This is Ames broken down into five points. He notes that inadequate dietary intakes of vitamins and minerals are widespread, and that we have a consumption, a excessive consumption of energy-rich micronutrient-poor refined food. Think Big Mac and fries. There are deficiencies in many micronutrients which actually cause DNA damage in cultured or living human cells. He proposes that DNA damage and late onset disease are consequences of a triage allocation based on micronutrient scarcity. I'm really going somewhere with this, follow me carefully. If the proposal is correct, he asserts, micronutrient deficiencies that trigger the triage response would accelerate cancer, aging, and neural decay, but would leave critical metabolic functions such as ATP production intact. So in other words, you can make energy, you can run from the saber-toothed tiger, <clears throat> but you may not live as long as if you had adequate micronutrients. And finally, he said a multivitamin, multimineral supplement is a low-cost way to ensure intake of the RDA of micronutrients throughout life. And I would add to that, it's also a good, good idea if you're taking a really good quality one to get a maximally health supporting amount of nutrients throughout your life. So I wanna show you what the nutrient sources and locations of iodine are. And then I wanna show you what happens with the most iodine rich diet on the planet. What do they have that we don't have? Well, you will see that seaweed, kelp, nori, kombu, akame uh, are great sources, but they're highly variable. Here are other sources. Most of us don't eat seaweed. Uh, there's one fermented seaweed called natto served in Japan, and that's where you could get an adequate amount of K2 if you actually ate it. But I, I, once upon a time, I had a patient that had lived in Japan. He ate it. He said, it is nasty. You do not want it. Uh, K2 we talked about in our webinar number one. So in, in common diet, seafood, dairy products, and it's in dairy products because the feed is supplemented with iodine, uh, grain products and eggs, 
and dairy products, especially milk and grain products, are the major contributors of iodine to the American diet. Gee, what happens if you are gluten intolerant and dairy intolerant, and you are on a gluten-free, dairy-free diet? Well, you, my friend, are not getting enough iodine, and there's a way to find out. And then if you're on a calorie-restricted diet, then sometimes it's difficult to get enough iodine. So <clears throat> this was an assessment of how much iodine the Japanese get. Remember, 150 micrograms was what was supposed to be the RDA in the US. Well, as a matter of fact, the Japanese get one to three milligrams, which is 10 to 20 times higher than the US RDA in their diet. 10 to 20 times more iodine. Do you think that that might have an impact on their health? And the answer is yes. So when we look at life ex expectancy for the US and Japan, they've got five more years of life. They've got three times, almost three times less age adjusted breast cancer mortality. They've got about 10 times less age adjusted prostate cancer risk. As a guy, that's of interest to me. Uh, Heart-related deaths, they got half as many, and infant deaths, they've got about a half. So here's the ratios. Breast cancer risk, 2.62 times higher in the U.S. than Japan. Prostate cancer, 10 times higher. Heart-related death, 1.6 times higher. Infant deaths, 2.4 times higher. And these people eat a milligram to three milligrams of iodine in their diet per day. That is not what the government people have got as an RDA here in this country. In fact, you need, you probably need more than that. <clears throat> so when you look at global breast cancer mortality statistics, oh, when you look at breast cancer mortality statistics, you will find that breast cancer mortality is declining in the US, possibly due to increased utilization of mammographic screening, early detection of disease, and availability of improved therapies. However, the Japanese still have us beat. I mean, that's reality. Now, there are a couple of ways to see if you have enough iodine. One is an iodine excretion test. Now, you have to pay for this. It's a functional medicine test. And you will see it's got up at the top iodine, how much was excreted in milligrams per 24 hours, and what is that excretion rate? So this person excreted 48% of the iodine that was put in them over 24 hours. Some people would say that's not adequate. Uh, if it was 5%, it would definitely not be adequate because, in other words, the body is holding on to the iodine and not letting it go. It's not being excreted because the body says, give me more. I want that iodine stuff. I want to take it into my cells. I want to use it. You can't have it back. I'm not going to let you pee it out. So this is the 24-hour urine excretion. This is a more straightforward test. Uh, those aren't ink blots. I ran it through Lightroom and edited it, so you couldn't see this guy's name. But he's, he's a very unique individual, and he has really jacked his iodine level up at times in the past because he's so enthusiastic about it. This iodine level is okay. It's right in the mid-range. Um, after what I read, I could see it being up in the upper range. If, if it was even a little bit more than the upper range, I would tolerate it. And by the way, you can see his reverse T3 is elevated, the evil twin of T3, and that he was under stress, and that means his thyroid axis was not working correctly. <clears throat> so I'm gonna start talking about supplements now and what you can do at the health food store or order from Amazon or order from here or your, or your chiropractor or your holistic doctor. I won't say order from your conventional allopathic doctor because they don't have supplements. So no nutritional supplement is FDA approved for the diagnosis treatment prevention or cure of any disease or medical condition. So I'm not going to assert that any of these things will treat your depression because I can't do that because Deshay says I can't do it. But I can say these supplements will do such and such and people that have such and such will improve with their depression or improve with their anxiety. So that's the way we're gonna go. 
This is the do-it-yourself testing at home. This has been known for a century. So you get tincture of iodine, Lugol's iodine is uh, liqueur iodi compositus. It sounds like something out of Harry Potter. You get it, you take your morning shower, you paint a two inch by two inch square on your inner arm. You write down the starting time. By the way, don't put a white blouse on right over that uh, immediately. Just, you know, short sleeves would be good now. Write down the starting time, observe the color of the patch over the next 24 hours, and record the hour the patch begins to lighten and the hour the patch disappears completely. What does that tell you? <clears throat> this is how you score your test. If the patch begins to be slightly lighter after 24 hours, that's normal. That means that your body um, has enough iodine. It didn't just suck it in through the skin. If your patch totally or almost disappears in less than 24 hours, you may have a moderate iodine insufficiency. If the patch disappears or nearly disappears in less than 10 hours, you have a severe deficiency. So you can, it's do it to yourself testing. Now, <clears throat> would your doctor approve? Probably not. Would he or she have heard of the iodine patch test? Probably not. But this is a test that can be done in a holistic practitioner's office. You can do it at home. You can do it at a health food store. Order yourself some Lugol solution on Amazon. That's where I got the picture for that and try it. <clears throat> and I'll tell you what actually that's got in it. So 6.25 to 12.5 milligrams per day seems reasonable if you are treating an iodine insufficiency. Three milligrams is what the Japanese get. And one drop of Lugol's is 6.25 milligrams. So if you want to get the amount of iodine that the Japanese get, five drops. And obviously don't put it directly on your tongue because the stuff tastes nasty. Put it in a glass of water and dissolve it. Or better yet, get pills because you can also do it with pills. So the interesting thing, and this was from uh, a site that I accessed just on May 10th. They quoted Remington Science and Practice of Pharmacy, 19th edition. And this is the historical background. Two to six drops of Lugol's containing 12.5 milligram to 37.5 milligram elemental iodine with 40% iodine and 60% potassium iodine was the recommended dosage for iodine to support the structure and function of the thyroid. Does the American Academy of Clinical Endocrinology like that? No, they do not because they're all about check the TSH and treat with T4, and this is a T4, and they're not gonna get any money from it, and Lugol's iodine is cheap, and I mean, my goodness, you, you put uh, six drops per day, that bottle will last forever. So it's not the current practice, but it used to be. <clears throat> Cautions and warnings. This would be better working with an integrated physician, but you can try it at your, yourself at home with these caveats. You can certainly do the test. That's not gonna hurt you. Be careful if you are already on thyroid medication, because if you are on thyroid medication and you're not quite there and you start taking iodine, you could really ramp up your production, or iodine and selenium, you could really ramp up your production and you'd end up having too much thyroid. Be careful if you have autoimmune thyroid issues where you've got inflammation because this could, this could excite things. But if the patch vanishes quickly at home or you have a blood iodine or urinary excretion test that's low, these doses seem reasonable. So when I lecture physicians on dealing with hormones, I say start like a chicken and go up like a boss. Uh, for you out there in internet land, I would say, if you want to start any of these things, I would start like a chicken and I would go up like a chicken. Itty bitty steps so that you don't push yourself into side effects. <clears throat> Iodine pills in the 6.25 to 12.5 milligram range are okay too. Now, I told you that 
T4 is converted into T3 in the liver and you must have selenium to do it. So in this FACEB journal, they said, modest selenium deficiency may increase the risk of diseases of aging. Remember what Bruce Ames talked about with his micronutrient triage theory of disease, where if we don't have enough, the body will take what it's got and it will put it for the critical things, but it won't necessarily be involved with DNA repair and maintenance. This is a study on selenium and cognitive impairment. This is what it showed. Selenium is one of the factors that can affect the risk of cognitive decline. The results were that low selenium status is a risk factor for cognitive decline, even after taking into account vascular risk factors. And why might that be? Well, if you don't have enough selenium, you won't make enough T3. If you don't have enough T3, your brain won't work right. Will the endocrinologist and the conventional doctor know that? No, because they're not checking free T3, they're checking only TSH, only TSH, and they're treating only with free T4. And by the way, when you treat with T4, T4 can be metabolized into T3 and reverse T3, and if you're under stress, you're gonna end up with more of the antidote than the good stuff. I know that this is kind of technical, but I swear to you, if you go over it and look at the slides and go through it in slow motion, it will make sense. So does selenium actually work for depression? Remember, this is a do-it-yourself, a do-it-to-yourself treatment at home. Well, in, my, in mice it does. It actually bound to the serotonin transporter in mice, which is like Prozac. It had Prozac-like effects in these mice. And this study said, that CMI, which was a selenoorganic compound, there it is written out, I can't even begin to pronounce it, reversed the behavioral and biochemical alterations in the depression, anxiety, comorbidity induced by lipopolysaccharides. What the heck is that? Those are infl inflammatory chemicals that were shot into the little mices or mouses um, intraperitoneally in, in the abdomen, and it causes them to be very inflamed. So it improves their behavioral and biochemical alterations by modulation of neuroinflammatory mediators and the serotonergic system. Prozac, Zoloft, Paxil, Luvox, Vibrid, Trintelix, Effexor, uh, Pristique. I'm just giving you the brand names. You name it, if, if it boosts serotonin, it can be used for depression and this boosted serotonin. Here's my caveat. Do not take more than 200 microgram per day. That's, that's my limit. It's more than the RDA, <clears throat> but no more than 200 microgram per day. And it's best to consume this and indeed your iodine in a multivitamin, multimineral supplement. The iodine, the selenium, the zinc that we've talked about, the vitamin D, the problem with multivitamins, most of them is that they don't have enough vitamin D and some of them don't have enough selenium. So as I was preparing to give a lecture on the thyroid one time, I opened up one of my sources of primary medical literature, first for women, that I saw at Schnook's grocery store here in Evansville. And I this headline grabbed me, the new thyroid cure, speeds metabolism by 653%. I wanted to know what that new thyroid cure was, so I bought it. I actually I actually bought the women's magazine there at the grocery store, and I hope nobody saw me. So this is what they discovered. Poor iron absorption to blame for thyroid slowdown. And in fact, two days ago, if you search on PubMed for iron deficiency and hypothyroidism, you'll find 167 citations. Here's one in the journal Thyroid back in 2002. Iron deficiency impairs thyroid hormone synthesis by reducing the activity of heme-dependent thyroid peroxidase. Don't worry about heme-dependent thyroid peroxidase, just it impairs thyroid hormone synthesis if you're iron deficient. Here's another study. Subclinical hypothyroidism was associated with iron deficiency. Here's another one. Iron deficiency is associated with thyroid microsomal antibody levels. Now, why am I, why am I pounding on 
iron deficiency. Oh, and iron salts and, and T4 work best. This is the reason I'm pounding on it. Because if you are iron deficient, you will not make enough hemoglobin. If you do not make enough hemoglobin, you won't be able to carry oxygen to your tissues. That should be tissues, not issues. And to your brain. Lab studies are useful. At CWI, we use the CBC, complete blood count, and also the serum iron, serum ferritin, and total iron binding capacity. And here's how to find out if you're getting enough iron. Do it to yourself at home. Why? Why is this a treatment for depression? Because if you're iron deficient, your thyroid won't work right. If your thyroid, thyroid won't work right, you won't make enough T4. And if you don't make enough T4, you won't have the raw material to make T3. And if you don't have enough T3, then you're going to be tired and fatigued and have mental concentration issues. And you will look classically like a, a depressed person. So here are some questions. Are you eating any red meat? You say, I'm a vegetarian, that idea appalls me. Great, get on an iron supplement. Do you have an ulcer? Do you have dark, tarry stools? You're losing it at your south pole. You need to get on some iron and get that ulcer under control. Are you a vegetarian? May not have enough iron. Are you a menstruating female? May not have enough iron. And then there's this history of menometrorrhagia, which I have had a number of women patients that have. Menometrorrhagia, to be blunt, is extremely heavy, bloody periods where it just keeps coming and coming and coming. It's, it, you're bleeding. And when you bleed, you lose blood. And when you lose blood, you lose hemoglobin. And then you have to make more hemoglobin with iron. And if you don't have enough, you're not gonna make it. And you're basically going to menstruate your iron or part of your iron stores right out of your body. And if you're fatigued, chronically tired, or depressed, you may be anemic. I've seen this over and over and over. I have sent many of my women patients, let's say, I think my record is up to either four or five women patients that had been so low that they had to have an iron infusion by my hematology uh, colleague here in town, one of my hematology colleagues. And I've had other women patients that I have referred to their OBGYNs and they have had an endometrial ablation, which means they will stop having super bloody periods and then they will hold on to their iron. DHEA, and I really wanted you to see that this is an important hormone. If you will recall in our first webinar, <clears throat> I talked about the disruption of cortisol rhythm and DHEA. And this is where your cortisol rhythm is supposed to be. This person is down low. They're in phase two adrenal exhaustion. And this is a spit test. And you can see that this person's DHEA is a little high. They, they may have been overly supplemented. But this is one way to get DHEA. However, I actually prefer another method, which I'll show you. I promise to make this painless. I've only got a couple things I'm going to highlight on this slide. Actually, before I do that, I will point out cholesterol is up at, up at the top. So if, if your doctor loves to get your cholesterol down, like less than 100, the lower I can get it, the better. The better he likes it. If you, if you reduce cholesterol too low, you won't make enough pregnenolone. If you don't make enough pregnenolone, you won't make enough DHEA. And if you don't make enough DHEA, you won't make enough testosterone or estradiol. Testosterone, it's the, the love, libido, sex hormone, muscle retention, energy, zest for life uh, in guys and gals. You won't make enough. And I'm going to skip that. I'm going to skip those. Okay, so DHEA, to make it painfully obvious, it is a hormone secreted primarily by the adrenal glands. It was discovered only in 1934, not that long ago. It shifts what's called the catabolic state, that's where the body is burning stuff, to an anabolic or protein building state, that's where you're building muscle, making testosterone. When you can get a lab, get DHEA sulfate. DHEA levels, those are drawn by amateurs. 
DHEA sulfate is where it's at. DHEA sulfate is the active form, is also fairly steady state. It's very smooth in the, in the blood, as opposed to DHEA, which can go up and down depending on what the adrenal is pulsing out at the time. So DHEA sulfate, please. So one day ago, Sunday, I looked this up. DHEA with fatigue, if you look it up on PubMed, 157 citations, energy, you can see that, endurance, chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, but this program is not supposed to be dealing with any of those. It's supposed to be dealing with depression. So check this out. DHEA with depression, 658 citations, more than any of these other topics that I'm showing you. If you have DHEA low, you will have probably low energy. If you're a woman, you'll have low testosterone because women make quite a lot of their testosterone out of DHEA. If you're a guy, you'll just be fatigued. This is another frontier of neuroendocrinology long-haired paper. This is what it says. DHEA and DHEA sulfate are both synthesized in the adrenals and brain. It's probably important if you're actually making it in the brain. The biological actions are neuroprotections, neurite growth, that means a little spine, so the neurons, antagonistic effects on oxidants and glucocorticoids, that means they're antioxidants. And <clears throat> accumulating data suggests abnormal DHEA sulfate concentrations in several neuropsychiatric conditions. And it's, I mean, it is well published in depression. So it, the question is, does DHEA improve depression because they're deficient in it or because it gives them more testosterone? My goodness, we're kind of consuming a lot of time. This is DHEA over-the-counter versus sustained release micronized, and this is the reason I tell my patients, do not buy it on Amazon. Do not get it at Costco, because what you get over-the-counter is instant release, and you can see what happens when you take instant release. It'll last four, five, six hours, and it's done for. You need a sustained release preparation. And you can get that in one of two places. Uh, you can get it from a healthcare office that actually has it pre-made and sustained release, or you can get it at a compounding pharmacy and have a physician prescribe it for you. Uh, that's more expensive. I suggest the physician office purchase. DHEA is best for symptoms of fatigue, depression, tired, can't get going, particularly if you've been along, through a long period of stress, like with COVID. The CWI method for women is we start 10 milligrams every other day, sustained release, going up to one dose in the morning. And men, we typically start with 25 milligrams, alternating SR, and then going up to 25 milligrams uh, per day. Women usually end up at 10 to 25, men usually at 25 to 75 milligrams. We've got some patients on 100 milligrams of DHEA. The do-it-yourself method is, yeah, the promise, do-it-to-yourself treatment. Go to the health food store, get DHEA 5 milligram tablets or capsules, take it in the morning for five to seven days, and then you go up to twice a day. Is it sustained release? No. Is it the best? No. But you will find out if you can tolerate it. So that's the reason to do it that way. And you can't buy SRDHEA on Amazon. Key concept is when we're tuning up the thyroid, we always try to tune up the adrenals first. I just presented it this way. I thought starting with DHEA would be a little bit off-putting, but we always like to take care of DHEA and cortisol before we start tweaking the thyroid. Okay, so... My nurse practitioner, Margaret Johnson, and I have been threatening to give this lecture called We Are Too Bad MTHFRs. And that is actually not a profanity. It stands for methyl tetrahydrofolate reductase. It is a gene. And we can see that gene on this lab. So I, I want to blow this up, and I'm going to go through it really quickly. This shows that the person will not respond to an SSRI. This shows that the COMT, which is basically a little Pac-Man enzyme that gobbles up neurotransmitters in the brain, 
will gobble up too many of your neurotransmitters and then you'll be depressed. It's the valve valve type, very bad. Uh, this shows that if they had ADD, uh, clonidine or guanfacine would work. Here's the pay dirt. Methylene tetrahydrofolate reductase, MTHFR. And you'll notice C677T, that's the major gene. C is in green, T is in red. Green is good, red is bad. Uh, A1298C, you'll see A is in green, C is in red, that's bad. So the, this person has one gene off in the, ma in the major gene pathway, one gene off in the minor gene pathway, and that means they are a, what's called a compound heterozygote. And that means if they wanna be happy campers and not obsessive, they may need to be, may, may need to be on L-methylfolate, right there. <clears throat> so this is L-methylfolate in one easy lesson. If you look down at the bottom of the screen where it says Google this, L-methylfolate colon a vitamin for your monoamines. If you put that in, you will land on this article. It is, it is the top thing on the page. It's by my friend and mentor, Stephen Stahl. And he starts out by talking about, this is how L-methylfolate is made from folate. You have folate in your diet, it's converted to dihydrofolate. You have to have methyl, methylene tetrahydrofolate reductase to convert it to L-methylfolate. You say, why is that a big deal? Well, because, well, we'll, we'll talk about why it's a big deal in a second. You can, it, even if you're starting with L-methylfolate, start it low. We use a 500 microgram. You can go up to 3,000 to 4,000 microgram per day slowly, but use only as much as needed and reduce for side effects. We have seen some people that are started far too high at, at other places and they have bad side effects. It's like you could peel them off the ceiling, so start low. I mean, imagine that. You're not making enough neurotransmitters and suddenly somebody blasts you with this supplement where you're gonna be cranking them out. So you're gonna go from way not enough to way too much for your system because it's not used to it and it can give you side effects. Caution number two, if the patient is on what's called an MAOI, a monoamine oxidase inhibitor, even treatment with L-methylfolate should be supervised by a physician. So again, caution one, I'm telling you, we use 500 microgram, you can buy 500 to 800 microgram over the counter. And the third thing is if you're on an MAOI, do not use any amino acid therapy unless the psychiatrist is supervising it. Now, let me show you the, the amino acid therapy. So this is why L-methylfolate is so important. Let's, let's start up at the top left. You have to have L-methylfolate to make BH4, tetrahydrobiopterin. You have to have BH4 to activate these two enzymes, tyrosine hydroxylase and tryptophan hydroxylase. You have to activate those enzymes so that tyrosine hydroxylase will take in tyrosine and convert it into dopamine and norepinephrine, and your tryptophan hydroxylase will make serotonin. So if you reason it backwards, if, if you're deficient in serotonin, norepinephrine, and dopamine, you're, you may not be making enough, and you're not making enough because your enzymes aren't awoken and uh, they're not awakened because you have low BH4 and you have low BH4 because you don't have enough L-methylfolate and you don't have enough L-methylfolate because you have an MTHFR deficiency. So down at the bottom of the page, you will see some nutrients that you can play with, but very carefully. Like, like I've told you, start like a chicken, go up like a chicken. So L-tyrosine, you can frequently find in acetyl L-tyrosine is like the top shelf product. You can use that, plug it into your tyrosine hydroxylase and you'll make more dopamine and norepinephrine. Dopamine is the pleasure chemical. It is associated with what I call a technicolor experience of life. If people are low in dopamine, I ask them if their life is like a boring film noir, or black and white movie. Oh yeah, it's like that. It's not technical. No, no. That's almost guaranteed they've got low dopamine. Uh, also with low dopamine and norepinephrine, you can't focus and you can't concentrate. And that's one of the symptoms of depression, lack of concentration. So remember, 
The map is not the territory. The symptoms are not the diagnosis. This was interesting for me to review. DLPA stands for DL, dextro-rotatory or right-handed, and levorotatory, left-handed, phenylalanine. Levoamphetamine, the left-handed, is natural to the body. D is not, it's synthesized, and D and L is not, it is also synthesized and combined. <clears throat> These, the DLPA seems to be more effective for depression, but the DPA, the dextrorotatory phenylalanine, and that's also a precursor to tyrosine, it seems to be very helpful with pain. There are some pain clinics that are using this, and I did not know about that. So I'm going to be going back and looking at that with some of my patients with chronic pain. And finally, 5-HTP is what you use. You can see uh, tryptophan plugging into tryptophan hydroxylase, which is converted into serotonin. We use 5-hydroxytryptophan, and that's con considered state-of-the-art. It's uh, much more powerful and penetrating than straight tryptophan. Tryptophan got a bad rap years ago because of the dreaded eosinophilia myalgia syndrome, which I actually saw at Mayo. We did a muscle biopsy on a guy, and he had all these eosinophil white blood cells infiltrating his muscles because there was a toxic uh, ingredient in one of the batches made in Japan. It's not that tryptophan is bad, it's just that batch was bad and it gave the whole product a bad name. So there are the happy neurochemicals over there, dopamine, norepinephrine, and serotonin. You can load up the precursors and you can also guarantee that the, the machinery is working by giving L-methylfolate if there is a genetic defect that you can see or if you can't get to your doctor yet, you could still try it. It shouldn't hurt you, um, but start really low. So in terms of placing your bets on do you have MTHFR, yeah, you probably do. At least 50% of the population has at least one base pair off. So you're, you're, you got better than even odds. 32.7% um, of the population have a mutation at A1298C which is the minor gene, and 25, one out of four people, one out of four, have both of the genes bad at the major gene, c 6 7 This was an Italian newborn study, but the, the uh, statistics fairly well propagate worldwide. Uh, Caucas specific Caucasians in North America may be a little bit different. But one out of four odds that you got both of those things off, and, and that's about right based on, based on what I've seen with our patients here. And the, the worst possible genotype of the minor gene, uh, about one out of eight. Moving to another fun topic, endocannabinoids. This was a paper published by Russo in 2016 where he described, he first of all, identified the endocannabinoid deficiency syndrome in 2001. And he said it's where the endocannabinoid becomes deficient and productive of pathophysiological syndromes. There are many brain disorders based on deficient neurotransmitters. Um, okay, so at this point, I have several more things to tell you about the endocannabinoid system and what you could do with that and what you can do with inositol, but it looks like I'm out of time. So Elizabeth, I'm going to, to um, uh, I'm going to exit my screen for a second, and I'm going to go on to the chat mode right here, and I want to take a quick poll of the audience. I mean, I don't mean to keep you up, and um, I don't want to belabor this, just send me a message. Do you, want, do you want me to keep going or do you want to wrap it up and do Q&A? Q right now, on the chat. Let me hear from you. Please keep going. Go on, please. Keep going. 
Yes, please continue. Go on. Okay, thank you. Then I will. And I really, the, the uh, end is not too far off. All right, so back to the clinical endocannabinoid uh, deficiency. When you look in the literature as of today, this morning, there are 61 citations on clinical endocannabinoid deficiency. It's implicated in many hard to treat disease states, fibromyalgia, chronic migraines, depression and anxiety, and irritable bowel syndrome. So in terms of what you can do to yourself at home, on your own, I'm telling you that CBD or CBG may be reasonable, maybe. And I'm gonna tell you that you are actually making your own cannabinoids in your body. Many people don't realize that. All right, so when you look at the endocannabinoid system, uh, as of yesterday, just the endocannabinoid system in general, there were 5,358 citations. Um, here is a paper that I really like from Current Neuropharmacology. There's a lot of stuff there, but it says endocannabinoids are produced by multiple cell types within the CNS. Endocannabinoids, not phytocannabinoids, endocannabinoids. And so I will tell you that before we knew that there was such a thing as endocannabinoid deficiency, the drug companies, in this case Lilly and Park Davis, came out with cannabis indica extract, oops, sorry, back up, and uh, on the left, cannabis sativa. And these were actually patented medicines by big pharma until one guy ended up derailing this and hemp and CBD was considered, you know, you're, you're, you're basically a drug dealer if you were doing it. So this stopped being available and the sad thing is it was extremely effective. The human endocannabinoid system has CB1 receptors up in the brain and THC will plug into that. And also CBD will plug into the CB1 receptors in the brain and also peripherally the CB2 receptors. So here's, here, here it is that this, this one, this is the Apple Macintosh view. This is the Windows left brain objective, just the facts view. So CB1 brain, spinal cord, reproductive and connective tissue, CB2 modulates the immune system. And then there's another endocannabinoid receptor called GPR55, which is linked to bone development and cancer cell proliferation. Am I telling you that if you take CBD that it'll stop your cancer? No, I am not. I'm saying that in studies, in a lab, it seems that it is linked to cancer cell proliferation. So you can take, you can take that and do with it what you will. So here's my basic course on endocannabinoids. You make endocannabinoids. You say, I don't want those cannabinoids. They're, they're of the devil. No, they're in your body. You may not have enough, but you're making them. There are really two kinds in the body, 2-AG. It's the most abundant. You can see what it does right there. <clears throat> and anandamide, which is Sanskrit for bliss. The hemp plant, where, where the college students get it and grow their own. Some, I had a patient one time growing his own marijuana in the closet, it was pretty interesting. But the, the, the classic hemp plant that is, that is designed to produce a lot of THC, that's what you'll smoke and, and get really happy and dumb. Um, that's a phytocannabinoid, but also so is CBD and CBG. So THC is the bad boy. That's the mind altering ingredient in hemp. CBD and CBG, not mind altering in the sense of uh, cool, man. It's not that kind of mind altering, but it will modulate your endocannabinoid system and may help with depression and anxiety. And so it could be used that way. <clears throat> this is the last thing I've got to share with you. Use of inositol. One of my patients that may be on um, 
I started on this for OCD. Um, I went to the literature. I just found this paper today, the double blind control trial of inositol treatment of depression done in 1995 in the American Journal of Psychiatry or the so-called Green Journal back then. The, the standard reference peer-reviewed magazine in psychiatry. So it was published with the big boys. And here's what Levine and colleagues, colleagues said. Inositol is not a neurotransmitter precursor. Tryptophan, DLPA, L-tyrosine, those are all neurotransmitter precursors. This is not. Instead, it's a precursor to intracellular second messenger that then contributes to making your neurotransmitter. So it's not a neurotransmitter precursor, but it's kind of like an octane booster for your brain to make more neurotransmitters via upregulating these intracellular second messengers. Don't ask me to explain that to you in, third, in uh, you know, a few seconds. Um, in the study of Levine and colleagues, the Hamilton Depression Scale, what we call the HAMD, it's almost like God's depression scale for psychiatry, dropped from 33.4 to 21.6. That's, that's a third at four weeks. The placebo group did not show a meaningful response. I mean, it actually worked. It, are there uh, drug reps that are calling on my office every day to uh, ply me with their wares about inositol? No, because there's no pharmaceutical company that's going to make big money off of it because it's not patented. It's a natural substance. And the other interesting thing about this is usually we worry about antidepressants taking bipolar patients and like pouring gas on the flame. This did not make bipolar patients more manic. It just treated their depression. Uh, Levine and Benjamin also found that it was helpful in reducing the number of panic attacks per week by two thirds. Now this was a small study, but they had 10 panic attacks in patients that went down to three and a half panic attacks per week. That's a drop by two thirds, a 60% reduction in panic attacks. Now what they used was 12 grams per day. And the only way that you're gonna get that much in is if you get a powder and mix it up in water. This is an isomer of glucose. So it has a sweet taste, it's, it's not objectionable. Just dump it in with your little scoop until, until you know, ideally you get up to 12 grams. But remember, you're gonna start like a chicken and you're gonna go up like a chicken. So if you wanna start with a 500 milligram capsule and take one of them uh, per day and then two of them and then three of them and then four of them, and if that's working okay, get the powder and start doing that, you can do that. And finally, it occurred to me that I had been talking about these chill pills in the first program <clears throat> on dealing with, well, actually the second program, dealing with the stress of COVID-19, but I'm not sure I actually laid them out for you. So GABA, gamma aminobutyric acid, is the only neurotransmitter that you can buy over the counter. I'll let that think in for a second. DHEA is the only hormone you can buy over the counter. GABA, GABA amino butyric acid, can be thought of as the brain's calmer downer neurotransmitter. There are actually GABA neurons up in the brain. They're called GABAergic neurons. And they squeeze out the stuff to chill you out. Sometimes you may not have enough. And so dosages can be 500 to 1500 milligrams per dose. The GABA 750 is from the big box nutritional store that begins with G. I've used that a lot in patients. You can take 500 to 1500 up to three times a day. Start like a chicken, go up like a chicken. L-theanine. 200 milligrams, up to three times daily. L-theanine is the calmer downer chemical in green tea. It's why people can drink cup after cup after cup after cup of green tea and not get the shakes, as opposed to cup after cup after cup of Starbucks, where you will get the shakes. You drink enough, you won't be able to hold your cup. So 
L-theanine. It's been described as Zen in a pill. And this one is unusual, taurine. You can actually find taurine in Red Bull and Monster energy drinks. And you say, why would you suggest something like that when I'm trying to calm down and not get jacked up? And the answer is because those crafty people that formulated Monster and Red Bull decided that the caffeine and all the sugar would jack up the people too much and give them the shakes, so they needed something to calm them down. So taurine is what they added. It is another natural calmer downer. It's an amino acid, it's in our diet. Uh, that's a pharmacologic dose, 500 to 1,000 milligrams up to three times daily. Now I double dog dairy if you're anxious to get up to 1,500 milligrams of GABA three times a day, 200 milligrams of L-theanine three times a day, and L and taurine, 1,000 milligrams three times a day, and tell me you're anxious. It, I don't think it will happen. And um, I, obviously I don't want you to start there. Start low, start like a chicken, go up like a chicken. Do one thing at a time. Don't start all three. Be methodical. Here are some questions that I have. What would, in, in the future, what would you want? Um, how do you want to consume this educational content? And are these webinars meeting your needs? And uh, I feel free to use the chat box and type that in or email me at lkatie at katiewellness.com. I wanna hear from you. What do you want? Am, am, am I scratching your itch adequately? Is this meeting your needs? Or are there other things that you would like to consider? And would you like more webinars on specific topics in the future? Because I'm really enjoying this. It's kind of like a public service, Mayo Clinic, where I trained, <coughs> had some core, uh, core ideas. One was education, that, that's the, what this is. One is, was charity, and we give to charitable causes. Uh, one, and one was patient care and one was teaching. So um, let me know what you want. And I'm going to close with Dan Burris's quote. <clears throat> Dan said, don't think either or, think both and. I love that quote. So please don't think either nutrients, <coughs> sorry, or prescriptions, or behavior, or getting your head square, screwed on straight with psychology. Think all of them. All can be useful. <clears throat> and finally, I'll leave you with this, the MBA of improvement. <clears throat> Mental is what you do inside your head. Biological is the stabilization of the biological platform and actions are what are you going to do with what you learn and the behaviors you need to take. Those are the only three things you can do to improve. Those are the only three things that you can do to get your head in the right place. So that's it. Thank you for attending. I'm gonna hang around for questions as long as there are questions. And uh, Elizabeth, I'm going to exit my screen share <coughs> and I'm gonna put you back in the driver's seat. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I was very busy writing and um, for some reason, uh, we did have some fascinating uh, glitches today. And I'm thinking, was there a full moon? I think there was. <laughs> no, I think it was fast. <laughs> so I'll be one of those people watching it again because I, I, um, I want to see those slides so I can get the uh, proper spelling as well. Okay. Right. And uh, so thank you. Thank you so You're much welcome. again. And on behalf certainly of Karina and I, all of you, this is all about helping um, each of you feel that you have uh, access to uh, this incredible information from Dr. Katie, who is really one of the rare doctors who is very much allopathic, traditional, trained or traditionally trained from the Mayo Clinic and years of uh, medical physician experience, but also now very much uh, one of the most knowledgeable people I know and I've worked with him for years in terms of integrative and being able to really balance through great research, 
um, as an insanely curious doctor, um, all the different things that you can do to um, well, handle the COVID-19 right now. I mean, this is really something for so many of us that um, high anxiety and stress um, are sort of a, happening every day to so many of us. So thank you very much. Now, well, a little, um, I see yeah. questions. Can, yeah. I, can I take it away? <clears throat> from, from one of my favorite patients, whose first name is Jamie, <clears throat> she commented, that poor chicken probably died from too many meds. I'm not quite sure which slide <laughs> you're talking about, but I'm sure she'll tell me. Uh, one person said she needs to find out what labs in her area, Calgary, Alberta, Canada, can do some of the testing. Uh, some of the tests that I talked about tonight very straightforward test, TSH, free T4, free T3, reverse T3, serum iodine, DHEA sulfate, standard labs. You can get them in Calgary. <clears throat> Plus whether the nutrients are available over the counter in Canada. That is an excellent question. And I understand that many nutrients are not. You can't get them. I have one of my friends who's a physician in Canada that when he would come to the U.S., would get DHEA extended release from the big box vitamin store that begins with G. And he, he, would, he would stuff them in his suitcase and take them back and he would get about a year's worth in one trip um, because he couldn't get it in Canada. That, that is one I know you can't get in Canada. I'd be astonished if you can't get vitamin D or selenium, but I'm not sure. <laughs> Well, actually, Dr. Katie, I can answer that. As oh, a, please. As, as a Canadian living in the U.S., and yes. we have Kareen Floyd, who is uh, a Canadian living in Canada right now on Vancouver Island. Um, and both of us, of course, being so much interested in uh, integrative medicine and integrative health. Um, I know that DHEA is considered a hormone, as you were very clear, and hormones are not allowed to be sold uh, or prescribed mm -hmm. than through uh, doctors. So that is quite true. I also understand you can get into trouble if you're caught bringing it across the border, which just yes. doesn't make any sense. Right. Considering that, you know, uh, legalized marijuana is across Canada. And so you have to be just aware of the right. different uh, laws. But again, it's not something I, I think is as enforced as it was 15 years ago. Right. Um, because so here's, some more, here are some more questions. One yeah. person says, I didn't get on the first two. Are they available for review? Absolutely. Uh, <clears throat> I have a page on my website that's supposed to be up and running or the, the internet page CW, excuse me, Katie Wellness Institute. So, I'll get it here in a second. KatieWellness.com forward slash hope. They should be there, but I guarantee they're on our YouTube channel. Yes. C W I YouTube.com. The first two are up at the top left. And this one will probably be up tomorrow. Um, can we also access the recording along with the slide? Yes, this will be on, on YouTube and you can put that on one screen and you can look at the slides with the other. Will my body, or on another part of the screen, will my body stop making endocannabinoids or any other kind of vitamin mineral if I constantly take them? No. Uh, it would be helpful to have a summary sheet showing the chicken steps for each recommended supplement. So <clears throat> I haven't prepared that. And um, my, my time is kind of tight right now. You wouldn't believe how, long, how much time it takes to put one of these webinars together. But I can tell you this. If you go to the health food store, if, if you're in the U.S., and you get the lowest dose and if it's a tablet you cut it in half uh, that's probably a good chicken place to start and then um, I like what Stephen Stahl says he, he he talks about the different the two different types of uh, psychopharmacology prescribers one is the Rambo style and one is the Indiana Jones style and the Rambo style just goes in with guns blazing shooting everything in sight and the Indiana Jones style goes in, thoughtfully considers the environment, and then comes up with a very crafty solution for the issue. So be like Indiana Jones, don't be like Rambo. So start low, start like a chicken. And I told the, the chicken dose is the lowest possible dose 
that you could take. For Lugol's uh, iodine solution, one drop. For vitamin D, I mean, I, I think people need more vitamin D, so, but you could start with 1,000 uh, IU and then go up. <clears throat> Um, I'd like to know those three things again. Uh, first thing is John. Um, John, I'm not understanding that, qu that question. You said, I'd like to know those three things again, dot, dot, dot. Thanks for sharing. Balance. So if you can just fire, fire a clarifying comment down there, I'll look at it. Um, <clears throat> one of my friends and patients says, I would like a webinar on the best diet for life. Elizabeth, we've got to make notes on that one. Um, okay, thank you. Thank you. Ah, this is a very useful uh, comment <clears throat> from, from uh, Maria. She says, actually, Alberta Lab Services no longer allows us to order anything but TSH. Sad for you no longer allowed to order vitamin D level. Uh, yes, we can buy vitamin D over the counter. DHEA, do not know. Thank you very much. I suspect you may be a physician or a healthcare practitioner. Thank, thank you for that question. <clears throat> Here's Corinne that says, uh, Lugol's iodine is not available in Canada. Uh, I don't know what's available in Canada, if it's Lugol's or... Um, uh, iodine pills, or if it's not even available up there, for sure, I would I would make sure that you're using iodinated salt. Get rid of the Himalayan sea salt. Get rid of the fancy schmancy kosher salt. Those exotic salts. Get get Morton's with iodine in it. Um, get get rid of some of the highly fluorinated toothpaste. Uh, do not use brominated baking powder use uh, iodinated baking powder. Um, oh, what you were saying toward the end of the program, John says, that they have to be done in conjunction with each other. Okay, so got that. I'd like to know the, oh, those three things again. Got it. <clears throat> Just think about getting your MBA. M-B-A. M is mine. We talked about that a lot last week. B is body. We talked about that a whole lot more this week as well as the first week. And A are the actions that you take. And <clears throat> last week, for example, we were talking about the mental state of this patient that was, you know, just wanted to drive to some state and die and was concerned she was going to get COVID-19. So the mental aspect was figuring out what was going on and writing it down, and what well, figuring out what was going on. That's mental. Writing it down in the journal, that's behavioral. And then thinking about what you write, that's mental. So it's integrated, MBA. Um, oh, M Maria is a psychiatrist. Thank you so much for being on the call. It's an honor to have you. And I think that's all of the questions. If there are other questions that I didn't get and I missed, we've got the chat thing open. Get your, get your comment or question in and I'll just wait for a few seconds until we close this out. Here we go. Sorry, to clarify, the endocrinologist can order other thyroid tests, not psychiatrists or family docs. <clears throat> well, I won't be immigrating to Canada to practice integrative psychiatry, that's for sure. Um, on the other hand, if I had a really, a really good endocrinologist that had mastered the peer-reviewed literature and knew about TSH, free T4, free T3, reverse T3, they knew all about that, if they knew about iodine, if they knew about selenium, I'd say, great, go see my buddy. The, the, uh, the awesome endocrinologist. And then I wouldn't have to think about it. But the problem that I have encountered in my practice is when I send them to the endocrinologist, the, the awesome endocrinologist retired. I can't send them to the awesome endocrinologist again. The awesome endocrinologist would put people on, 
Armor Thyroid, which is porcine thyroid. It's a combination of T4, T3, T2, and T1. He was good. He got results. My patients came back smiling with energy and optimized uh, thyroid functions. And the TSH was great, which is what I was checking, but he was looking at all of it. <clears throat> I'd be happy to, to send somebody there and not have to worry about it. But the problem is I am, I will be frank, disgusted at the incompetence that I see by my allopathic brothers and sisters who have been brainwashed by medicine by committee and the AACE that says check TSH and treat with T4. And that flies in the face of the literature. And that's what's being done out there. And I just refuse to keep shoving antidepressants in people trying to fix their mind or through their biology when there's something else wrong with them. Ah, okay. Jamie has clarified it. She said, if the chicken was taking an MAOI, <coughs> it would die, as most psychiatrists would not know about the supplements. Okay, fair enough. Thank you, Jamie. And I think that's it. I'm not seeing anything else up there. All right, so thank you for joining us. Elizabeth, thank you so much for your help and emceeing. Corrine, thank you for all the hard work that you've done. We'll be back next, next Monday, week. same bat time, same yep. bat channel. And next week, I don't think it's going to be nearly this long. It'll be how to save money on your health care. Elizabeth, I'm going to let you close this out. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. We'll see you again. Uh, again, it's all about sharing. Um, feel free to share the invitation that you get, and it will be the same, a different link, but uh, you'll be getting, receiving, if you've registered, you'll be receiving the invitation directly from Katie Wellness and Dr. Lewis Katie. So thank you all for attending tonight, and Dr. Katie, it was great. Thanks. So time well spent. Thank you so much, everybody. And thank Good you night, for everybody. your participation, and thank you for all the, the thanks that I got. Very sweet. I'm, I'm touched. See you next week. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.